are necessary to improve our communities. And you should not be underestimated because you all come from a long legacy of intelligence and innovation, and also you have an opportunity to change awesome. the world. So next up, we're going to have Janice Lee, who is the, oh, she's coming up. But anyone, anyone here, can you tell me, I'm going to go around. I'm going to start with this team, if you don't mind. I'm, like, I'm going to come to you next. Can you tell me a little bit about why you enjoy coding? Uh, I just really like you know, being able to create things uh, to be able to better the world and stuff like that. Who else feels the same way? Come on, people. So we have an opportunity to make a lot of different things today. Now, on average, you will have all day to great to make sure you take breaks today and make sure you stay tuned in because we're going to have an opportunity to meet some of our other mentors and guides. Next up, we have Janice, well, Janice Lee, Director of Digital Engage Engagement from Toyota. Take it away, Janice. Good morning, everybody. I'm so proud, excited, honored to be here with you guys. Um, Mr. Graves did a great job introducing everybody. I can't wait for everybody to get started. Toyota is really proud and honored to be a part of this event. Black Enterprise, TGI, everybody working with us on this. So we're really excited. Hope you guys got a lot of rest. Mr. Graves alluded to some great prizes. So I'm gonna outline those to you guys. Don't know what they are, right? Okay. First prize, or let me start with third prize. Third place winners today uh, to, uh, of the event get Chromebooks. Each team member will get a Chromebook, which is pretty cool, right? Second place, Samsung Galaxy tablets. First place of the hackathon for this event, and this is the third annual event, it's amazing. I heard from Shelly, first year was five, five schools, second year was 10 schools, this year was 15 schools, so Toyota wanted to step it up and make it worth you guys coming all the way to California to participate in this event. First prize is $40,000 to the winning team. So no pressure at all, but you guys have to bring it. So I read all of your concept documents. I'm so excited for all of you, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. So congratulations for being here, making the trek, and good luck. Let's get to work. Yoli. So we are back. Thank you, Janice, for all those prizes. I would like one of those prizes just for being here and being in support of this hackathon. And anyone, anyone have a particular prize they are aiming for? What, what, num number one, what is number one again? 40,000, listen, what would you do with $40,000, Kanta? Come here. See, I'm, I'm gonna bring up one of our hackathons. Remember, you're gonna have to introduce yourself. And he's so confident. Everyone, give him a round of applause for coming up here. All right, so what is your name, Kanta? Uh, my name is Darian Wonkwo. And where are you from, Kanta? I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I go to school at Morehouse College. That is the, so. What would you do with forty thousand dollars? My school loan is gonna get paid off. That's see, this is responsible. <laughs> this is our future. That is a responsible uh, message to spread. So, are you excited about being here today? Most definitely. Not one, one statement. If y'all can step it up to eighty thousand dollars, though, we can do something for real. We can pay. All, <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can pay our school loans, and we can take a trip. Well, if here's a, here's another idea. What about taking that 40,000, creating a whole new app that'll make you that 80,000? I can do that. Okay, see, we gotta, we gotta have productive planning. Well, thank you very much, Kanza. So next up, we have Kyle from Twilio, and please, Kyle, take it away. Hello, everyone, good morning. I'm super excited to be here today. My name is Kyle Womb. I'm a software engineer at Twilio. How many of you are familiar with Twilio? So if you aren't familiar, a good amount of you are, but if you aren't, you've probably interacted with it before through Uber or Lyft experience. So whenever the driver calls you or, you or sends you a text message, they're using Twilio's API. So in a broader sense, Twilio is a cloud communications API that allows people to, 
people to integrate communication into their apps. So how exactly does Twilio work? And so we have this notion of phone numbers. You have a Twilio phone number. So say someone texts your Twilio phone number, and then you have your own app deployed somewhere in the cloud. So Twilio makes, whenever someone sends an SMS to that phone number, Twilio makes an HTTP request to your app. And then your app responds to some, with something called Twimmel, which is Twilio markup language. Essentially, it's XML. And it says, how do you want to handle this? And then Twilio sends the reply back to the phone. So let's do this in practice. So I'm going to do a quick demo. So let's first purchase a phone number on Twilio. And where's everyone from? I want to uh, buy a phone number with a specific area code. Anyone have any specific? All right, I'm going to do uh, 334. <laughs> so let's buy a Twilio phone number with 334 area code. Boom, Phoenix City, Alabama, or somewhere in Alabama, so we're going to buy it. So phone number is $1 a month, but we're going to give you all some Twilio credit so you all can get up and running with Twilio. So we're going to buy this phone number, so 334-650-6494. So now we're going to set up this phone number. And so this right here is what's called a webhook. And this is where your app is deployed. So what we're going to do, Twilio, instead of us having to deploy our own app, Twilio has this thing called functions, where we can just have, it's serverless, and it's hosted on AWS within Twilio. And they also have templates to get you up and running. So we want this to be really easy for you. So we're going to use the Hello SMS template. And we're going to name our path TCX. So here, we create our Twimmel object, our Twimmel messaging response object. And in the message, whenever someone texts us, so on the event of incoming text message, whenever someone texts us, we want to tell them, thank you for watching this demo. As a gift, use this promo code for $20 in Twilio credit. And the promo code is going to be TCX2017. You may, th you may be thinking, $20, man, that's not enough. But the most expensive thing on Twilio is a phone number, and it's a dollar a month. So you, you can do a lot with $20 here. And so now we're going to save this. So where our app is going to be deployed is this path here, slash TCX. I'm just going to copy that and put it back in our phone number. Save that. So if everyone can take out their phones, and text anything to 334-650-6494. And the number is here on the stage, I mean on the screen. And let me know when you get this, when you get a response. Anyone get a response yet? You did? Perfect. So that's Twilio in a nutshell. Um, Twilio also has a voice product. And I'll be here mentoring. And if you need any help with working on Twilio's API, just reach out. And also for the data, the APIs, we're, we're working on that right now with Toyota. So we'll get that to you all soon. Thank you. So, so is everyone ready? I think it's all. Here we go. So is everyone ready? Do you understand what's going on? Are you prepared for the day? OK. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are going to take a commercial break, and we will be right back to meet our mentors and our schools and students. We'll see you in a little bit. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place for a cocky coder. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened.
we want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive lot. The only place for a cocky coder. But I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened. Lift off of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work boot that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining, every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery weight that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. 
HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota Mother of Invention. box to watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high-pitched... I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better color than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. Yeah! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. We remembered seeing people playing soccer with anything. We took this love of soccer, combined that with a lack, and that lacking was energy. That's what it is to harness the power of play. Imagine everything you do when it's dark, and imagine that you couldn't do any of that. One out of five people in the world don't have any access to power whatsoever. No matter where you go, even if you're the richest person in a, in a community, you might not have power. What those people rely on is kerosene. One night in a house with a kerosene lamp burning is like smoking two packs of cigarettes. Not only do they have the serious lack of infrastructure for power access, but then their solution is killing them. It was about four years ago. I can't believe how many years it keeps. Yeah. I, fall, I feel fall like, 2008. Oh, oh, it's I old, know. yes. We're in a class called Idea Translation, Affecting Change Through Art and Science, where they want you to basically come up with a need, mm -hmm. an issue, mm -hmm. and then come up with some sort of solution, or at least a way to address that issue through art and science. We're taking the activity that people already derive joy from and happiness and saying, keep doing what you're doing because it can be functional. It seemed natural to us because we weren't trained in science. All the engineers that we had spoke to were like, no, it's impossible. And we literally just said, shut up. We're going to make it possible. <laughs> the technology behind the socket is actually very simple. 
It's like a shake to charge flashlight. So it's essentially a magnet moving inside of coils. We applied this same simple technology, tweaked it, and put it in a ball that actually harnesses energy from rotation. The lamp that we mass produce and we distribute with the balls, uh, with our older version, 30 minutes of play would give you about three hours of light. With the new ball we're working with, actually, we're looking at significant improvements in the play to power ratio. Apart from a light, we can use the socket as a platform to power many different accessories. You play around with it, you plug in very simply, and your cell phone is charging. I'm glad that we have a ball, but there's still so much more we can do with the socket. There's still so much we can, more we can do with Uncharted Play. We have so many ideas in the pipeline of how to take the play and use it to address real world issues. If you are a creative person, if you feel like you can make a change, then you're an innovator, you're an inventor. To invent is just to see the world as you want it to be and do something. TV? Nope. Don't we need a run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. Lift off of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work boot that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining, every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery rate that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. 
Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota Mother of Invention. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... So I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... So I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. <laughs> I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... So I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. Look 
liftoff of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work booth that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers, which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining. Every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery rate that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota mother of invention. to watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high-pitched... Yeah, yeah. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. 
My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders. So I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> So wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. We remembered seeing people playing soccer with anything. We took this love of soccer, combined that with a lack, and that lacking was energy. That's what it is to harness the power of play. Imagine everything you do when it's dark, and imagine that you couldn't do any of that. One out of five people in the world don't have any access to power whatsoever. No matter where you go, even if you're the richest person in a, in a community, you might not have power. What those people rely on is kerosene. One night in a house with a kerosene lamp burning is like smoking two packs of cigarettes. Not only do they have the serious lack of infrastructure for power access, but then their solution is killing them. It was about four years ago. I can't believe how many years it keeps. Yeah. Fall, I fall like, 2008. Oh, oh, it's old, yes. Yeah. We're in a class called Idea Translation, Affecting Change Through Art and Science, where they want you to basically come up with a need, mm -hmm. an issue, mm -hmm. and then come up with some sort of solution, or at least a way to address that issue through art and science. We're taking the activity that people already derive joy from and happiness and saying, keep doing what you're doing because it can be functional. It seemed natural to us because we weren't trained in science. All the engineers that we had spoke to were like, no, it's impossible. And we literally just said, shut up. We're gonna make it possible. The technology behind the socket is actually very simple. It's like a shaker charge flashlight. So it's essentially a magnet moving inside of coils. We applied this same simple technology, tweaked it, and put it in a ball that actually harnesses energy from rotation. The lamp that we mass produce and we distribute with the balls, uh, with our older version, 30 minutes of play would give you about three hours of light. With the new ball we're working with, actually, we're looking at significant improvements in the play to power ratio. Apart from a light, we can use the socket as a platform to power many different accessories. You play around with it, you plug in very simply, and your cell phone is charging. I'm glad that we have a ball, but there's still so much more we can do with the socket. There's still so much we can, more we can do with Uncharted Play. We have so many ideas in the pipeline of how to take the play and use it to address real world issues. If you are a creative person, if you feel like you can make a change, then you're an innovator, you're an inventor. To invent is just to see the world as you want it to be and do something. watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high-pitched... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lift off of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. 
The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work boot that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining, every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. But they are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery weight that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota mother of invention. Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. <laughs> and this is the story of how in the world that happened.
Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place for a cocky coder. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> But wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. <laughs> and this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. TV? Nope. Don't we need a run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place for a cocky coder. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened. Liftoff of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work boot that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining, every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. 
The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery rate that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying, essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota Mother of Invention. Watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. Yeah, yeah. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. We remembered seeing people playing soccer with anything. We took this love of soccer Combine that with a lack, and that lacking was energy. That's what it is to harness the power of play. Imagine everything you do when it's dark, and imagine that you couldn't do any of that. One out of five people in the world don't have any access to power whatsoever. No matter where you go, even if you're the richest person in a, in a community, you might not have power. What those people rely on is kerosene. 
One night in a house with a kerosene lamp burning is like smoking two packs of cigarettes. Not only do they have the serious lack of infrastructure for power access, but then their solution is killing them. It was about four years ago. I can't believe how many years it keeps. Yeah. Fall, I mean, I fall like, 2008. Oh, oh, it's I old, yeah. We're in a class called Idea Translation, Affecting Change Through Art and Science, where they want you to basically come up with a need, mm -hmm. an issue, mm -hmm. and then come up with some sort of solution, or at least a way to address that issue through art and science. We're taking the activity that people already derive joy from and happiness and saying, keep doing what you're doing because it can be functional. It seemed natural to us because we weren't trained in science. All the engineers that we had spoke to were like, no, it's impossible. And we literally just said, shut up. We're going to make it possible. The technology behind the socket is actually very simple. It's like a shake to charge flashlight. So it's essentially a magnet moving in inside of coils. We applied this same simple technology, tweaked it, and put it in a ball that actually harnesses energy from rotation. The lamp that we mass produce and we distribute with the balls, uh, with our older version, 30 minutes of play would give you about three hours of light. With the new ball we're working with, actually, we're looking at significant improvements in the play to power ratio. Apart from a light, we can use the socket as a platform to power many different accessories. You play around with it, you plug in very simply, and your cell phone is charging. I'm glad that we have a ball, but there's still so much more we can do with the socket. There's still so much we can, more we can do with Uncharted Play. We have so many ideas in the pipeline of how to take the play and use it to address real world issues. If you are a creative person, if you feel like you can make a change, then you're an innovator, you're an inventor. To invent is just to see the world as you want it to be and do something. watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lift off of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work group that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining, every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery weight that soldiers have to carry every single day. 
We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying, essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds, or a 200-pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear, and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota Mother of Invention. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. And this is the story of how in the world that happened. Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> so wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You've got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. <laughs> and this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free, hardware free, commitment free, even couch free, walls free, pants free, just completely free to be free free because that's how we want it. Direct TV now, live TV on any screen, only from AT&T. TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high-pitched... <laughs> I'm 
I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <laughs> So wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free. Walls free. Pants free. Just completely free to be free free. Because that's how we want it. Direct TV now. Live TV on any screen. Only from AT&T. I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving, to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work group that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining. Every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agent the announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery rate that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying, essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds, or a 200-pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear, and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. 
My name is Hannah Alexander and I'm honored to be a Toyota Mother of Invention. Thanks for tuning in. We are here at the Be Smart Hackathon sponsored by Toyota, where our students have been working diligently to bring the next and best innovation in app development. We are moving on to the workshop portion of our day. And first I have Joseph, I'm gonna say it wrong because I'm always getting wrong. Singimana. I got see I'm I'm I know what I'm doing. So Joseph is the Executive Director of Diversity Inclusion at Intel, and he's gonna come up to introduce our next speaker. Please come up, Joseph. Give him a round of applause, everyone. Hi, everybody, how you doing? Good. I hear you had a long day today, but in, you know, looking at you, you, you think you just got here. That's the excitement I'm seeing in the room. Well, I'd like to welcome you to San Francisco on behalf of Intel. Um, and we are very excited to be part of this event. Um, we will be here with this workshop uh, that uh, my colleague Cindy is gonna, uh, uh, is gonna do with you guys here. And then we will also host you tomorrow uh, at the Intel headquarters in uh, San Jose, San, Santa Clara actually. Um, so we're all excited about that. Um, I'm not gonna bore you too much. Let me introduce my colleague, Cindy Ng. Uh, she's part of our drones group. I think you've, I don't know if you've had a chance to see some of that technology. Um, I don't know if you watch the All-Star game, NBA All-Star games, or, or Super Bowl. Uh, all the, that technology was displayed there. So it's the group that Cindy's in that actually developed that technology. And she will, she will kind of go over that technology with you and the application of the technology. So enjoy the session. And I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, I know that you've, got a, you've been here for a couple days now. So um, really thanks for your attention today. Um, I have a lot of content to go through. We can go as deep as you want um, or not. And really feel free to ask me any questions on the way, along the way of the presentation. Um, as you have those uh, questions. So I think a lot, I'm from the drone group at Intel, um, and I think a, it's confusing that Intel is in drones for a lot of people because we are known as a chip company, right? We make bi microprocessors. And so people try to, they don't understand, like, is there a chip in the drone or why are you doing drones? And really it's, it's pretty simple. It's very much aligned to uh, our strategy and what Intel really does best. Um, if you think of what a drone is, it's really the way we think about it is it's a flying computer, right? So the drones go into the air, they have a payloads or cameras, and they're just constantly snap, 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 taking hundreds and hundreds of pictures, um, hours and hours of video, and all of that takes a lot of storage. Um, it takes a lot of processing power to figure out what to do with all that data. And so we really think of drones and data, or data um, as the new oil, and drones as just being one mechanism of that data. So let me play you a video, and it really, I think this video uh, kind of paints a really clear picture of why Intel is in drones and what the vision of drones is uh, for Intel. It's been said that data is the new oil the single most valuable resource of the next few decades, with the power to disrupt industries and fuel a global wave of innovation. And if data is the new oil, then UAVs are the new oil wells. With their ability to capture precise data in even the most difficult and demanding situations and environments, UAVs have emerged as one of the most important new technologies of the data age. From agriculture, to construction, to infrastructure inspection, even entertainment. Drones are now a critical component in the quest to extract real, actionable value from data. The kind of data that requires powerful computing performance to analyze and can drive game-changing improvements in business performance. From optimizing supply chain efficiencies to reducing costs, to discovering entirely new paths of revenue growth and profitability. At Intel, we're hard at work combining key technologies with our UAV platforms, from 5G 
to predictive analytics, to machine learning, to seamless integration with the cloud. So, if you want to see the future of the data revolution, all you really need to do is look up. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna spend time today and just talk to you and share with you about what the drone group does. Um, we can, again, spend more time in some of these areas if you're more interested and less time for in other areas if you're uh, not as interested. So basically, within Intel, we are uh, focusing on commercial solutions, um, the data analytics. So once you fly the drone, it's got all the pictures, all the video. Um, what the heck do you do with that? Um, it, me it, needs to, it needs to turn into some, something meaningful for the, the customer and the client. So that's the data analytics part. Uh, we do light shows. Uh, as Joseph said, you may have seen uh, the light shows um, at the halftime show at Super Bowl this, this year with the Lady Gaga. Uh, we, we just did a, uh, a light show in Los Angeles uh, with the uh, Wonder Woman uh, DVD release. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's one of the things I'll talk about today. And then we also have focus on ingredients and technologies. So. Um, as an example, this is a picture of uh, Volocopter. Uh, Volocopter did its first public flight in, in Dubai. Um, so it, it was the first, it, it's a taxi. It's supposed to carry people. And it had the first public uh, flight just last week in Dubai. OK, so I'm going to start first with uh, commercial, commercial solutions. So what does that really mean? Um, so for us, commercial means um, agriculture, construction, and then as you can see here, um, energy and utility. Um, and basically, the way that we uh, think about our drones is that it's um, basically addressing these segments and these usages. Um, so if we take a look at inspection, um, we use the drones uh, to do inspection of uh, refineries, inspection of cell towers, um, airplanes, and really, it's, it's doing it in a, a new way, a new safer way. Um, because if you think about how inspection is done today on a bridge or a cell tower or an airplane, it's done with, with people, right? So you have to climb up the cell tower, um, you know, go under a bridge to see if it's safe. And it's, it's slow. Um, it's manual. And, and there's, you know, today, uh, drones are doing it in much uh, faster, safer, uh, more effective ways. Um, something I want to share with you that uh, we are pretty proud of at the drone group is, um, you know, with the, with the hurricane that we had in Houston, uh, we actually used one of our drones, uh, we sent it down to Houston, and we were able to inspect one of the bridges to, to, to decide, is it, is it open, can we, can we open it, and is it going to be safe to drive on? Um, so that's just a, a, an example. Um, construction. Again, you know, historically, if you need to, uh, survey a construction site, you have to shut it down. So everything has to shut down, and then you, you, the guys go and survey it, and then you bring it back up. So that costs money. Um, and then agriculture. Um, we can use drones uh, based on the payloads. The, the, the drones can fly over the fields and decide, you know, are there crops that need more water? Are there crops that are overwatered? Are there some um, pests uh, that are coming? So again, uh, drones are, are used to um, help with some agricultural usages as well. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, in these usages, I'm more like, like, not quite as industry ready, but like game development, one thing I would think of is like mapping areas as you fly over. So like one thing I noticed in some games I like is that they have a really good representation. Would this be, would that be a possible application for the technology? That's, 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 it, um, because you're because you're mapping a city, um, that's going to require a drone that can fly uh, long distances, right? So at Intel, we have both the multi-rotor drones and we have the fixed wing. Um, so the fixed wing absolutely would be something that uh, would be used to map a city. Uh, map a city, map miles and miles of railroad, um, inspect miles and miles of power lines. Um, those are some of the usages that we would do with the fixed wing product that we have. You know, like I said, um, inspections, this is kind of just shows, you know, how inspections are done in the conventional way. So with bridges, you can see there's guys kind of hanging, hanging under the bridge, 
and you've got a, you have guys hanging off the cell tower uh, and power lines with helicopters, right? So it's it's expensive, it's slow, um, and it's endangering lives of people. And, and so with the commercial applications of UAVs, uh, we think that it can be improved in many ways. Again, you know. Uh, looking at the, the old way and the new way with UAVs, um, if we were to, to take a look at a 300-foot flare stack, so this is an example from the oil and, oil and gas industry. Um, so historically, what would have to happen to inspect a flare stack, the plant would have to shut down, and that costs about a million dollars. Um, and not only we have to shut down, we have to wait for the flare stack to cool down. Oh. I guess I'm going to use this one. So you'd have to... So you'd have to wait for the flare stack to cool down before it was safe for anyone to go up there. Um, they're saying it takes about 100 man hours to inspect the flare stack. Um, you have to remove equipment and then restart it up again. So again, very expensive, very timely. Um, with UAVs, you, know, you can keep, keep the plant running, just fly there, so there's zero downtime. Um, it takes about eight man hours flight time, um, safer, and you can just dynamically do the survey and the uh, thermal injury, imagery. So it's really about business transformation. Um, and you know, as you can see here, just investing in a drone, a, a drone or two, uh, can get you a huge ROI. Right, another example that I mentioned earlier, um, if you're trying to survey or map a construction site, um, historically you'd have to stop all jobs, uh, and for safety reasons, you'd have to ask all of the personnel to move off of the area. It takes about 600 minutes of survey and downtime. You have to wait for data processing, and it's, it's, it's dangerous, right? So again, with the UAV-supported method, you can deploy the drone uh, while the, the construction site is in full production. It takes about 15 minutes, or you know, just one person to, to fly the drone. Um, and again, uh, safety is a key, uh, key value proposition. So let's talk about the drones that we do have at Intel. Um, fortunately, didn't have a chance to carry these with me in the car, but uh, I heard you guys are coming to uh, Santa Clara. Um, so I think if you guys have time, I'd love to have you guys come to the lab and we can show these to you. Um, so Intel Falcon 8 Plus is our uh, multi-rotor drone that we have on a roadmap. Um, it's got eight propellers and it's a, it's a V shape um, to maximize uh, inspections and, and maximize uh, line of sight. Um, the Intel Sirius Pro is the fixed wing product. Um, so again, this, the difference between the Falcon 8 Plus and the Sirius Pro, the rotors and the fixed wing, is that the fixed wing uh, allows us to uh, cover a larger area. So the fixed wing, again, is what you would use to do uh, to map a city. Um, the fixed wing can't fly, it can't stabilize, and it can't go up and down. So for inspection usages, the Intel Falcon 8 Plus is the product that we would have for that. And then another thing that we have as an offering uh, at Intel for the commercial solutions is automated uh, the flight planning. So basically, um, you, you tell the drone, I want to look at this area. You press a button, it flies. It'll, it'll do the flight plan based on what you tell it to do, and it'll land. Um, so that's what we mean by an automated, uh, automated flight planning. These are some, some details on our Intel Falcon 8 Plus system. So it, it's a best-in-class uh, payload to weight ratio. It's a pretty, the, the bird itself is pretty light, and the payload that it can carry uh, is pretty hefty. Um, right now, it, it carries a Sony, Sony Alpha 7R. So if you know anything about cameras, a Sony Alpha 7R is sort of a, the workhorse uh, camera from Sony, uh, 36 megapixels um, images that it captures. Um, it's got a fully electronic and propulsion system. Um, so if, you know, if one or even two of the propellers shuts, shuts off, um, the drone and the whole system is smart enough to accommodate um, the loss of the, the propellers, and um, it, it won't come crashing down. Um, it's a resistance against magnetic field disturbances. Uh, this is really important um, when you are on a boat and there might be a lot of steel, or if you're trying to uh, use the drone to inspect power lines, there are the magnetic field disturbances, and our Falcon A Plus drone is able to um, accommodate that. 
um, and the, the compass doesn't get messed up. Uh, like I said, it's got the uh, patented and V-form eight motors, uh, triple redundant autopilot. Um, and the other thing that the Falcon is really good at, good at is um, it can stay accurate and maintain hold um, in really windy conditions. Any questions about the product? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know about it, from hot to cold, I'm not sure about that, but when we do our testing, we'll take it to Phoenix, Arizona, and, and just test it in really hot temperatures. And then there's another, and then um, I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit later in, in the presentation, but we also flew this drone in the Arctic. Uh, we used it to track uh, polar bears. So that's an example of you know it being able to operate in really cold temperatures. Okay. Uh, here's a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna run a video uh, just to give you uh, more details on on what this drone can do. Meet the Intel Falcon 8 Plus drone, the new standard for commercial grade UAVs. With advanced safety features like triple redundant IMUs and full electronic system redundancy and power and communication between all flight components, it enables real-time error compensation and offers powerful position control. Plus, with adaptive flight control and propulsion redundancy, it can even adjust automatically to sudden or unforeseen changes to its center of gravity. In fact, with the Intel Falcon 8 Plus drone, the possibility of disorientation is virtually eliminated. And with no sensor initialization required, missions can be started anywhere, anytime. This provides unrivaled stability in windy conditions and solid position hold, as well as the ability to perform survey missions while flying optimized trajectories at high speed. Operators will also appreciate the ease of use associated with a multi-rotor UAV combined with the efficiency of a fixed-wing device, allowing demanding tasks such as a spherical panorama for auto function that results in approximately 80 single, high-resolution pictures formatted for easy stitching in under four minutes. It even compensates for motor failures or propulsion loss. The Intel Falcon 8 Plus drone features triple redundant IMUs paired with fully adaptive flight control. Together, these add up to the absolute best in class in performance, precision, and safety, and raise the bar for commercial drone performance and productivity worldwide. You may have noticed the, the Aztec brand in the video. Um, I didn't mention it before, but Aztec stands for Ascending Technologies. It's a company in Germany that we acquired. Um, so it was, the, the previous drone was called Aztec Falcon 8. Um, and then we acquired the company, um, and then we've been doing uh, uh, modifications and changes to it to make it available in, the, in North America, US and Canada. Um, previously, it was not. Okay, so I'll quickly just go over our fixed wing product. It's, it's called Intel Sirius Pro. Um, you know, 1.6 meter wingspan, uh, 2.7 grams takeoff weight. The cool thing about this is that you can, you can you hold it like this and it just launches from your hand. Um, so it's pretty fun. Um, flight time up to 50 minutes. Um, 50 minutes for this one, uh, we quote 16 to 26 minutes for the multi-rotor. Um, so you can see this is a lot more efficient, and this is the one that you would want to do, use if you want to um, map large areas like, like cities. Um, you know, great accuracy, um, no, no ground control points needed, and you can see that it, right now it supports um, three, three different payload options depending on what the customer uh, wants to use it for. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, with mission control, um, you, can, you can just plan your flight, press a button, and it's gonna go and, and run its course and come back. Um, it does full 3D mission planning. It basically determines the best mapping mode um, for the area of interest that you want to map. Uh, it calculates a flight plan. Um, it, it does the 3D terrain adaptive planning. It does all the safety checks and actions. 
uh, real-time controls, measurements, and airspace integration. Okay, so those are the drones. Um, but then what do you do with all of the data? So you've captured all your videos, you capture all your pictures, you put them in your computer. Um, it, it needs to mean something for the end customer. Um, so data analytics is a service that we, uh, we would offer the customer. Um, we announced it uh, earlier in September. Um, it's called the Intel Insight Platform, and it basically does the data analytics for, uh, for the client. Um, you know, there are some enterprise companies that, you know, they don't really, they don't, first of all, they don't really, um, they don't want to own their own drones. So, you know, while companies may need inspection, they don't want to own their own fleet. Um, they don't want to learn all of the FAA regulations. They don't want to be able to hire a pilot. So something that we are trying to do is, is really offer the clients an end-to-end -end solution. So you know, not only will we um, do, do the flight for you, and we'll take all the data from that, that, the capture, and we'll do the data analytics. So you can see here there's 2D and 3D maps that can be generated um, by all the information that I captured. Uh, there's digital service models and intelligent analytics. The customer just wants to know, is my bridge safe enough for people to drive on? You know, do I have corrosion um, on, my cell, on my cell tower, on my wind turbine? Are there, things, are there areas that I need to fix? And that's what, that's what they care about. OK, now I'm going to talk about light shows. OK, so. So the light shows, uh, the drones for the light shows are a completely different grounds of design. Um, so the Falcon A Plus that I mentioned and the fixed wing Intel Series Pro is specifically for the commercial applications. Now the light shows are done with a, a much smaller and much lighter drone. Um, in 2016, our first show, our first public show was at Sydney, and that was June of 2016. And then later, later in the year, uh, we did a show in Mexico uh, for Coca-Cola um, as a client. And that was with 100. Now, fast forward to 2017, we have scaled to, we've done about 20 shows now. Um, last holiday, we did, we did shows in uh, Disney World uh, during the holidays. As I mentioned, we did a Super Bowl halftime show with Lady Gaga. Uh, we did a show at Coachella. Um, and are really pretty much all over the world. Um, and it's, this is a pretty exciting for us. And if you, think about, if you think about this technology, yes, it's for entertainment. Um, but at the same time, the technology behind it is, a, is one to many. So it's, it's the ability for one pilot to be able to control hundreds of drones. Uh, we, call that, we call it a fleet. And if you think about how that could be used, um, uh, besides entertainment, you know, if you let's say a search and rescue, I think is one one application that could be used with a fleet of drones. Like say someone falls out of a cruise ship, for example, um, it's a lot quicker for a, for someone to send many drones instead of just one drone um, to look, look for that person. So that's an application. Um. <laughs>
that was just a fence sizzle reel just to show you guys um, all the shows that we've executed in the last couple of years. Now the drone that we use is again, like, like I mentioned, it's grounds up specifically for this. Um, we call it the Intel Shooting Star drone. Um, super lightweight and safe. Um, it's got four billion color combinations and you know, really uh, fun and amazing experiences uh, to the consumer. Um, basically the way it works is um, it's all controlled by, by one pilot, right? So the technology is the ability for a one-to-many um, type of uh, controller. And we have launch pads where you know, all of the drones, all 100, 500 drones have launch pads. They, they get charged all at once. Um, and then they, all, they also leave from the launch pads. So launch pads is kind of like home base um, for the shooting stars. OK, I was told that we are running short of time. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a little bit. And I, just, I do want to talk about um, some of the warmer, softer side of drones, um, which I, I find has been really uh, fun for me in my, jo my job personally. You know, we talk about, we talk about our strategy. And like I mentioned, it's, it's mainly focused on commercial. Um, but in the last couple of months, you know, it, it feels good to be able to use the drones also for um, improving the lives of, of people um, and animals. And you know, when we came up with our business models and we set our strategy, we never thought that a drone could help with search and rescue in, in Houston, um, with the earthquake in Mexico, um, with the hurricane in Florida. And it feels really good um, to be able to do that. Uh, we also have a partnership with the Menlo Fire District. Uh, Menlo is about, I would say, 15 minutes south of here. Um, and Menlo Fire District, uh, they're very forward in the way that they think about how to use technology in, do in doing firefighting. Um, they partner with Intel, and they are trying to figure out how they can employ drones um, to better fight fires and um, save lives. I mentioned we had drones for disaster recovery. And then just earlier this week, we launched, we launched a campaign on World Animal Day, which was on October 4th. And I'd like to share with you this video um, that we did with uh, drones in the Arctic uh, looking for polar bears. We are out here above 80 degrees north latitude at the edge of the polar ice. We're using the Intel Falcon 8 Plus drone here to look for polar bears because of some of its unique capabilities. By knowing where they are, where they're moving to, how many they are, we can track these changes and help preserve the Earth's environment. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Lowe, and I'm a pilot on the drone team at Intel. In the Arctic, there's obviously very extreme conditions. the wind, and it's a perfect place for us to test the abilities of the Intel Falcon 8 Plus drone. The drone provides a lot of safety. It has eight propellers, it's got redundant power systems, communication systems, which lets it be stable operating in GPS mode all the way from takeoff to landing. The drone is commonly used for inspection, surveying, mapping types of commercial operation. This is a new use case for looking for polar bears. It allows us to be much more unobtrusive than something like a helicopter. It's going to be right where we need it to be, giving us a nice, stable picture. The FLIR thermal sensor is very accurate. We are able to detect the bear on a cold, snowy background, on a rocky shore, as well as swimming in the water. been able to see just a couple of degrees difference in temperature between the bear and its surroundings. I hope people will see that Intel is bringing this incredible capability in this drone to help determine the polar bear population so researchers can use that to help them with their climate research. So that was actually in July. Um, so we sent uh, Jeff, Jeff is a pilot on my team, we sent him out to the Arctic in July, and I think that was probably the highlight of his career. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, if we have time, I can take some questions. Yes. Hey, my name is Olivier Bea, uh, computer science student at North Carolina A&T. 
I was just curious to know, you talked about the <clears throat> that last run, which is so being able to uh, accommodate for motor loss. Up to how many motor losses? Can... I think we've tried it with two before. Okay. Yeah. When we, when we take it to trade shows, we'll actually turn them off on purpose. So okay. we've done up to two. I don't know that we've tried more than, more than two. And what's the, what's, I guess what's the process after that? Does it return back to the base to be able to, if it was to lose power? If we were to lose power, um, there's, there'd be some safety warnings that would come up for the pilot, and then the pilot would know that, hey, I should bring the drone home. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ivan Emden, uh, electric engineering major at A&M University, Alabama A&M University. And my question was, you mentioned earlier machine learning applications. What are some of the machine learning applications that you've seen for this technology? Um, so um, things like uh, predictive analytics, I think, would, is an example. Um, we, we're not quite there yet, but it's something that we're working on. Um, for example, if you're doing inspection or if you're doing something from an agriculture perspective, uh, we, want, we want the drone to be able to, to tell us you know, I think you might have some pests here. You may want to spray some more pesticides here versus having it all come back to us on our PC, having us comb through all the data. Gotcha. So those are, would be some examples of, of machine learning and okay. um, AI. Thank you. I think there's one back here. Hello, my name is Nathan Enti. I'm a junior at Bowie State University, majoring in computer science. Hi, Nathan. And my question is, um, well, I just found it cool that uh, the drone was able to detect the bear in uh, closed uh, hidden areas, and that was just, I just found that really cool. Um, my question was, has um, Intel experimented with facial recognition using the drones? Uh, we, ha we have not specifically looked at facial recognition, but mm -hmm. um, that's absolutely, I think, um, you know, a very valid uh, use case mm -hmm. that we that for the future, um, for security as an example, I think that would be very very uh, relevant. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think oh, in the back of the red shirt. Uh, oh, hold on one second, though. Majoring in information system engineering with a minor in cybersecurity. My question to you is for the drone, um, in case there were to be any storms or type of rain, what would the drone do and would it be able to detect as far as uh, getting under a rock or like somewhere to cover? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, because, of, because the drones uh, have cameras attached to it, um, the lenses, you need to stay clean in order to get really great images. So if there's snow or rain, we, the pilot probably shouldn't be flying or operating that drone for that day. So we'd have to wait it out. Okay. Yeah, Thank it you. Would, it wouldn't make sense for the camera to have stuff on the lens because it would get in the way of, of the integrity of the images. Good one. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question up front here. Where? Who has the question? Here you go. Tuskegee. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Gabrielle Taylor. I'm a senior computer science major at Tuskegee University. Hi, Gabrielle. Um, and I was just wondering, um, with like the light show and everything, um, so how, what exactly like goes into them? Like how does that work? Um, because I know, um, one pilot like working all of the the drones can be probably challenging so um do they set it up beforehand or is it like with this beat like to the music like these this color comes around or uh, how does that work yeah i'm happy to share that with you so um when a client comes to us and says hey i want to do a light show um the first thing we need to understand i think the most important that thing we need to understand is where where is it mm -hmm. because there are very a lot of regulations around where you can fly um, so we have to make sure that we abide all, all those rules uh, within the FAA. So once we determine that you know this is the area that's safe to fly, we get permission from the FAA. Mm -hmm. Then we'll work with the client to talk about you know how long do you want the show to be, uh, what kind of 
animations and what, what kind of characters do you want, to, do you want in the sky? Mm -hmm. And so we do, have, um, we do have graphic designers and we have animators um, on staff. So we will work with the client and then design the look and feel. If they want music, then it just takes rehearsal. Mm -hmm. so, in, so before we launch a light show, we will have to get to the location, do all the setup, we do other rehearsals. That's so it's, it's, a, it's a long process, but it's wow. pretty fun. Cool. Any other questions? OK. Great. Thanks, guys. All right, please give her a round of applause, everyone. So we are going to take a quick break, but please be smart and stay tuned as we have another presenter and workshop for you. So we will be right back. and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You've got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free, hardware free, commitment free, even couch free, walls free, pants free. Just completely free to be free free because that's how we want it. Direct TV now, live TV on any screen, only from AT&T. watch TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high-pitched... Yeah. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you got a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You've got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free. Hardware free. Commitment free. Even couch free, walls free, pants free, just completely free to be free free because that's how we want it. Direct TV now, live TV on any screen, only from AT&T. 
liftoff of the Delta rocket with opportunity. When I was 14, two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, landed on Mars. And that was hugely inspirational because we were seeing some of the first images come back and everybody was cheering and I was like, gosh, I want to be a part of that. The mission of Soul Power is to make self-sustained wearables that make people's lives better. We like to think we've created a, a new category called wearable energy harvesting. Devices that use normal motion like walking, running, moving to charge useful electronics. Our first implementation of that is a connected work group that helps workforces be safer and more productive. So here we have a prototype boot, and what happens is every time you step down, it's creating power, it charges a battery and an electronics board in the front. And that board has accelerometers, which measure motion, temperature sensors, GPS sensors, and a Wi-Fi module so it can send all of that data to the cloud. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime, if it's sunny out, if it's raining. Every time you step, it's spinning that generator. It's actually 10 times more efficient without fatiguing the user than any other type of kinetic charging. Wearable technologies like Soul Power uh, will fundamentally change how we work. I grew up in upstate New York in Ithaca. The Mars rover program was going on at Cornell just down the street. That really uh, inspired me to study robotics and study engineering and ended up getting to intern at, at NASA, so actually getting to work on some of the technologies that support that program. Soul Power came about as part of a class project at Carnegie Mellon. We were asked to create technology that solved a problem for students on campus. And we came up with a way of putting lights on shoes so students could see where they were going at night and cars could see them while they were walking. And naturally, we needed a power source for it. So we came up with this way of sustainably charging the lights using the motion in somebody's step. The U.S. Army, when they're interested in supporting a type of technology, releases what's called a broad agency announcement, which says that they have a problem and they need innovative companies to help them fix it. They are trying to reduce the amount of backup battery weight that soldiers have to carry every single day. We told them what technology we could build, we asked for their assistance, and we built it and delivered it. And those same benefits can be applied to many other industries like construction, energy, remote surveying essentially anywhere where somebody's off the grid and you need to know where they are. This is the Hulk. It's a machine we use to test that the charger is meeting the requirements that we built it to. One of the requirements is that it doesn't break when somebody's stepping on it. So it's actually built to withstand 750 pounds or a 200 pound person plus 50 pounds of military gear and it has to support three times their body weight because three times your body weight goes into the heel strike of your step. HANA is the backbone of Soul Power. Um, everything that I do, everything that we all do at Soul Power is just building off of innovative work that, that she started. Science, technology, and engineering is the future. It's really, really important that we have diversity of thought when we're attacking really challenging problems. And when you do create something that's solving compelling problems for people, it, it does feel good. I would tell young girls, go into STEM, not just because we need you, but because it's awesome. My name is Hannah Alexander, and I'm honored to be a Toyota mother of invention. TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. 
My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place for a cocky coder. I have this app called Gorilla Mom. Are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You've got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. No! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. We remembered seeing people playing soccer with anything. We took this love of soccer, combined that with a lack and that lacking was energy. That's what it is to harness the power of play. Imagine everything you do when it's dark. And imagine that you couldn't do any of that. One out of five people in the world don't have any access to power whatsoever. No matter where you go, even if you're the richest person in a, in a community, you might not have power. What those people rely on is kerosene. One night in a house with a kerosene lamp burning is like smoking two packs of cigarettes. Not only do they have the serious lack of infrastructure for power access, but then their solution is killing them. It was about four years ago. I can't believe how many years it keeps. Yeah. I, fall, I feel fall like, 2008. Oh, oh, it's I old, know. yes. We're in a class called Idea Translation, Affecting Change Through Art and Science, where they want you to basically come up with a need, mm -hmm. an issue, mm -hmm. and then come up with some sort of solution, or at least a way to address that issue through art and science. We're taking the activity that people already derive joy from and happiness and saying, keep doing what you're doing because it can be functional. It seemed natural to us because we weren't trained in science. All the engineers that we had spoke to were like, no, it's impossible. And we literally just said, shut up. We're going to make it possible. <laughs> the technology behind the socket is actually very simple. It's like a shake to charge flashlight. So it's essentially a magnet moving inside of coils. We applied this same simple technology, tweaked it, and put it in a ball that actually harnesses energy from rotation. The lamp that we mass produce and we distribute with the balls, uh, with our older version, 30 minutes of play would give you about three hours of light. With the new ball we're working with, actually, we're looking at significant improvements in the play to power ratio. Apart from a light, we can use the socket as a platform to power many different accessories. You play around with it, you plug in very simply, and your cell phone is charging. I'm glad that we have a ball, but there's still so much more we can do with the socket. There's still so much we can, more we can do with Uncharted Play. We have so many ideas in the pipeline of how to take the play and use it to address real world issues. If you are a creative person, if you feel like you can make a change, then you're an innovator, you're an inventor. To invent is just to see the world as you want it to be and do something. Welcome back to the Be Smart Hackathon sponsored by Toyota. Up next, we have Ruben Harris, who's a, who is a contributor to Black Enterprise Magazine, and he is also the co-founder of a new company called Breaking Into Startups. So Ruben, please take it away, sir. All right, cool. First of all, can we give a shout out to Yoli and Shelly for organizing this amazing event, please? Another round of applause. So um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier today, this is a workshop, so we're going to put in work. We're definitely going to be calling people out. Um, and just so I could get a sense of the room, how many people in the room listen to podcasts? A few people listen to podcasts. OK, we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, so apparently, this is called uh, bulletproofing your future and the skills that you need alongside of your degree. And I think that the reason why they asked me to present today is because um, I've never gotten a job online. Um, I've gotten into different spaces. I bought a one-way ticket to San Francisco, had a place to live for a month. Three weeks later, I found a job, worked at a, a healthcare technology company, an education technology company, a political company. Before that, I was in investment banking. So today, we're going to cover uh, three things, which is awareness, 
um, storytelling, and then um, and then nonverbal communication. So uh, just so I could get a, get a better understanding of what you all want to do, how many people in the room want to be engineers? Okay. How many people want to be salespeople? Okay. How many people want to be data scientists? Okay. Product managers? Okay. Okay. Consistent theme across the board. Who, who are the spokespeople for the pitches later on in this event? Okay. Okay. And so the reason why I asked those questions is because we're going to talk a lot about telling your story. Um, because it's going to be a big factor when it comes to uh, not just getting a job, um, but also when it comes to uh, pitching your company, when it comes to motivating the rest of your team as a product manager and things like that. Um, but um, uh, when, when I think about awareness, and the reason why I talked about awareness is because uh, you got to know the game. So even though you all might want to be engineers or product managers or whatever, it's very important to understand uh, the other roles that exist in a company. And so... Um, when you think about telling your story, I think it's very important to think about five things, which is um, you want to think about, you want to say a little bit about your background, you want to talk about what sparked your interest and in whatever, you want to talk about what you did to develop that interest, um, and how you, who you're talking to today, and then why you're here uh, today. That pitch is a little bit different when it comes to, um, to um, pitching a company and things like that, um, but the reason why it's really important is because um, a lot of times we have a lot of advantages and disadvantages that we feel that um, may set us back. Um, but I think it's important to um, to learn how to turn those things into something that's positive. So um, this is going to be a part where it's a little bit more interactive. And so for those of you that said you all are, are engineers or that want to be engineers right now that are kind of like in the junior range right now, can you raise your hands? Okay. You. Are you are you a mentor, or are you working? You're in the hackathon. Okay, so can you come up and tell your story as if like you're trying to be an engineer? Okay. Can we put a round of applause, please? What's, up? What's your name again? I'm Ivan Emden. I'm Ivan. a yeah electric engineering. Okay. Junior at Album a &M University. Okay, awesome. Nice to meet you, Ivan. So, um, welcome to Black Enterprise. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of great things about you. Tell us a little bit more about, uh, walk me through your resume. How'd you get here today? Well, it all started back in high school with a teacher who was over enthusiastic about, about advancing us, more so than we were. He really put us through some paces as far as like making us go above and go the extra mile with our code and really bulletproofing us. We bring him a solution. He say, no, it's wrong. I just broke it. Fix it. And it sucked so bad. <laughs> but after a few weeks, we started to get the hang of it. And it really gave us a knack for, uh, for getting stuff together done right the first time and taking time to like think about edge cases and all little stuff that could mess a code up. And you know, from that experience, I took it to high school, I mean, to college, and worked on stuff from a professor. He said, hey, I like your code. You worked for me this summer. Yeah. And so I got my research position, working with FPGAs and other yeah. electric engineering stuff, internships at Google and whatnot, uh -huh. out here doing all kinds of cool stuff, all because uh -huh. of that teacher who really wanted to bring stuff out of me that I didn't even see yet. Yeah. So I think my, my story boils down to education yeah. and people who are willing to mentor you and find those mentors in the yeah. workforce. Well, I mean, this guy sounds pretty pitch ready. Do you think tools, what, can you guys put your hands together for that? That, that was good. I was, I, was look, I was looking for a little bit more of a mess up, but that was good. But, but when you were coming up with that story, was there anything that you felt that set you at a disadvantage before like a low, a low GPA or like coming up from a low income background or anything like that? I would say my tendency to doubt myself, okay. like one of my main things I've, I've struggled with is fear of failure. Okay. And one of the ways I combated that, well, turned it into an advantage, yep. was like I was saying, when I make code, uh -huh. I always double check. Yep. I never just make one iteration and say, oh, it's perfect. No, yep. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Let me find a way to make it better. Yep. And that really makes for some great progress over time. So my yeah. code always gets better as it goes on. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a very great point because I was in a similar position when I was trying to break into industries because I, I had a very low GPA coming in. So as a musician, I was traveling a lot. And my mindset that was that as long as I could perform, it didn't matter what it said on paper. And so people kept getting on my GPA. And so, you know, I, I knew that I had to get my skills up and like always, always turn the, the question around and, and flip it. And so I think you did, did a good job there. Um, when it comes to um, imposter syndrome, did you ever feel like you 
you uh, didn't belong when you first started your first internship? My internship at Google, I, it hit me real heavy. Like, I was seeing all these smart folks around me, and I was like, I don't know half of the stuff they know. Like, it seems like they just have so much knowledge that just happened instantly, but I had to realize they all started somewhere. They all had a process to get to where they are. Mm -hmm. And even though it felt like drinking from a water hose, I mean, from a fire hydrant, I was like, <laughs> I got to put the work in and yeah. taking the time to really put the work in and, and do stuff and, and have work in private so you can have success in public was really my, my main thing that I grew with there. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. How many people in the room know what imposter syndrome is? Okay. Have you all felt it as well? Okay. Okay. I, I definitely, I don't know if you guys have spoken with Kyle yet over there, but he's, he's at Twilio right now. He's actually going to be on our podcast later, but he talks a lot about um, about imposter syndrome as well, how, how he overcame that. Um, and so, um, yeah, no, that was good. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the other thing that we're gonna talk about is, um, is uh, nonverbal communication. And so the reason why I think nonverbal communication is really important because even though he did a fantastic job at speaking, a lot of times when you walk into a room, especially as brothers and sisters, um, we are communicating a message that we don't intend to be communicating. And so I am gonna call somebody else out on stage um, because I think it's, you wanna think about five adjectives that uh, you want people to think when people see you or hear your name. And so, um, let's see. Can you come up, please? <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> Put a round, hand, round of applause for her, please. What's her name? Christina Williams. Nice to meet you, Christina. And so, uh, you want to be an engineer? Yes. An engineer. Cool. What kind of engineer? Um, software engineer. Software engineer. Okay, so when you, when people hear your name, Christina, what are the five things you want people to think of? Um, I would like people to think that I am generous, kind, um, caring, um, very intuitive. Um, what number am I? Generous, kind, caring, intuitive. One more. Um, and God fearing. And God fearing. Okay, so like those are words, right? Those are adjectives. But what does someone that God fearing look like? Um, I feel like they should see it from the outside. Huh. Everything from the inside uh -huh. always comes to the outside. Mm -hmm. So if you believe in something, um, your beliefs will reflect how you act and how you um, hold yourself, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we could go down the line with the other things, but the reason why I think this is very important is because um, you all, I'm very confident, have the skills to do the job in whatever it is that you're doing, but a lot of times when you're in there, you get reprimanded for a lot of things that you actually didn't intend to do. And something that I learned very early on is that sometimes our reality is not reality, it's perception is reality. And so a lot of times when you, gotta, uh, when you know the game, when, when you move to a new space, um, you got to understand, you know, not just not the nonverbal communication, but also just the way that people present themselves and how they dress. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. So, because like when I say what what it looks like, it's not always just like how you how you uh, like postures and, and features on your face. Because a lot of times, um, for example, when I was in Chicago as an investment banker, I would wear a suit all the time, not realizing that a lot of the the junior bankers wore uh, just button down shirts and they thought that I was really arrogant because I was doing that. But then when I was an investment banker in Atlanta and I wear, wore button down shirts, they thought I was really lazy because everybody wore suits. And so the point that I was trying to make was that, you know, I want all of you all to think about the nonverbal piece of things and also to think about um, how you dress in addition to those things because um, Christina, I'm gonna be looking out for you and we wanna be paying attention to like how you speak before you walk into the room. So thanks for, for explaining that to us. No problem. Okay, okay, that was good, no. And so um, going back to the, um, how many people, to the, to the knowing the game piece of things, how many of you all listen to or read blogs or newsletters? Podcast. Okay, so just so I can get a sense, you can call it out. You don't have to come up, but what blogs do you read? 
Android or Thor Energy, okay. Pot, Live Hacker, that's a good one. Podcast, no? Okay, that's why, the reason why I'm asking this is because like, um, a lot of people when they're trying to move into a space, not just to get a job, but also to, get, to start a company, they don't study the game. And a lot of times we talk a lot about um, playing chess, not checkers, but a lot of times you don't know the, you don't know the pieces on the board, and you don't know the value of the pieces, you don't know the way that the pieces move. And so even though each one of you are studying to, to do a certain type of uh, job, it's very important to understand everything else. And so I highly suggest um, listening to things like um, This Week in Startups, listening, like subscribing to all the newsletters like A6Z Newsletter, Social Capital Partnership, um, all kinds of things like that because it's very important to not get too bogged down into your own skill because you're gonna be working together with people like you all are right now in order to deliver what you gotta deliver. And so if I was gonna summarize the biggest way to bulletproof your career is the, is the storytelling piece uh, because even though he told the story very well for a job perspective, a lot of times people are able to raise millions of dollars or sell a product or a service or get pre-ordered for a service before it even existed. So how many of you all saw the Tesla Model, Model 3 announcement, right? He raised millions and millions of dollars pre-order before it was even produced. And that was all because he knew how to tell the story very well, right? On the other hand, if you tell a story very badly, it could go wrong, just like you guys saw the bodega startup situation, right? You guys saw that? If you didn't, you should look it up. You know, like, it's very important to understand those types of things. And the, the final thing that I think is very important to understand, too, when, it's, when it comes to, um, to launching a company, since you guys are pitching things, is to remember that, like, if you, if you aren't embarrassed at the first version of your product, you've launched too late. And what matters more than just, like, access to investors and things like that is that you've done something, you've talked to your customers, you've got traction. And then those people will like be wanting to get aligned with what you're building because they want to get in at the ground floor versus later. And so that's that's the the best piece of advice that I could give to you all. So that's that's my opinion. So that's that's it. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, <laughs> name's Adam Burns from Prairie View A&M University, computer Shout engineer. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, what books do you read on in your pastime to help you know further your knowledge, whether it's you know for yourself or for whatever you're trying to get into? Great question. Um, I would say the first thing that I read to understand the game was um, the CS183 notes. Um, you could look them up, it's free online, but they were actually turned into a book called Zero to One. Um, and so I definitely think that's a good book. I would say the hard thing about hard things is also a very good thing if you want to understand the game. Um, even though I think I only saw like one or two hands here that said they want to be salespeople, I think it's very important to understand how sales works because in, embedded in everything. So I think challenger sales are very important to understand because you all could build the most amazing products in the world, but if people don't know about it, nobody will be able to get to it, right? And so the CS183 notes, if you, list, if you read chapter nine, it's about distribution. And very few people focus on the distribution piece of things, and that's probably what's most important after you build a product that people want. Um, other books that I like um, are, um, let me think. How to Win Friends and Influence People, I think is also very important. Um, and then other that, than that, I listen to a lot of podcasts myself. I think the reason why I keep emphasizing podcasts, if you guys don't know and girls don't know where your podcast app is on your phone, pull it out. It's a free resource. There's a lot of knowledge in there. They don't teach in school. Um, it's because um, they, you're able to get like the equivalent of a of an MBA in a week, if you like really, or, or in a month or whatever, if you like really get that hard. You guys may be working all the time, don't have time to read online, but you all have a commute. You all might be working out, and it really helps uh, iterate 
like reemphasize those types of things. So I listen to the Jacko podcast. I think it's a really good podcast. Um, I listen to the Tax Stone podcast. Um, I listen to um, what's some another one that's really good. And this week in startups, and then also breaking the startups. Um, I don't listen to it. I, I record these stories because it's important not to just hear from people that look like you, but from people that have been through what you've been through. Um, and not just so that you know how to break in, but also so you know how to level up. And not just level, leveling up is not just important, it's very important to understand different subjects like mental health, layoffs, salary and equity, things like that. Um, and with that, it makes me think about the Rap Radar podcast as well. Um, and just thinking about how much, how there's a lot of um, commonalities with the music industry and the tech industry. Um, and like similar, like you guys are doing hackathons, that's like a beat battle trying to get in. Or if you're thinking about, you know, trying to, you know, present your resume, that's like trying to show your mixtape and your demos. Um, you know, trying to get signed and you got a messed up deals because you didn't understand what the contract looked like and the type of equity you were offered, right? When you realize how much value you created for the company, right, then the company, uh, the, the label puts most of the money behind the biggest artists, the other artists get forgotten. You realize how much value you created for the organization. You either start your own label, which is like the new VC, or you started your own company, which is like going independent, starting your own startup. So, and the reason why I bring that up is because we understand music is part of our culture. And um, I know this is a very long-winded answer, and I went away from books, but it's something I think about a lot. So, yeah. Any other questions? What school? Uh, Alabama. Alabama. Shout out to Alabama. <laughs> hey, how you doing? My name oh, is well. uh, Simeon Hood from Alabama A&M University. Nice to meet you. So Simeon. I heard you speak about um, getting companies to believe in your uh, at the ground level. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the most important asset to actually have a company believe in your product at the ground level mm -hmm. rather than waiting for it to level up? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about from an investment perspective or trying to get a job perspective? Uh, investment perspective, uh, like a pitch. Okay. So most investors invest in team. So there's like a bunch of ideas that are really amazing, but I would say most investors are really focused on the diversity of skill sets amongst your team, and they're really looking for people that are technical, right? And in addition to that, they want to see people that have traction. So I would say in the beginning, a lot of times the pitches are actually really terrible. And the thing that they care about the most is team and traction. The reason why the team is really important is because you all can have an amazing idea that sounds awesome. And then you all start building it and you might run into something that you didn't expect. And so you need to have a team that knows how to pivot without flinching and handle those objections like he talked about before. You wanna think about all the reasons why people wouldn't invest in you or wouldn't accept you into a job and have answers for them or have a plan to solve them. And if you all wanna look something up about this that he just brought up, look up something called the Idea Maze, going back to your thing, the Idea Maze by Balaji Srinivasan, who was actually the guy that helped me get into tech, um, and it's B-A-L-A-J-I-S-R-I-V-I-N, I S A M something like that. Biology Srinivasan, Idea Maze. Um, check that out. So, any other questions? What's going on? Tuskegee. Shout out to Tuskegee. Hi, um, my name is Gabrielle Taylor. I'm a senior computer science major at Tuskegee. And um, I just wanted to know, or you talked about how like we are viewed um, and like the things that we think about ourselves and that we want other people to see. Um, so how do we know how we're viewed and like how can we um, improve, like how can we, uh, <laughs> I guess, get people to see what we want them to see, if that makes sense. I think that's a great question uh, because um we can do everything that we talked about today, which is thinking about those five adjectives and thinking about how you want to be perceived and do everything that we can to try to present ourselves in a way that we want to be presented. But to your point, it's very important to ask other people what you think, like how things have been going, what they think about you. Um, something that I learned a lot um, in the Bay Area, especially if like, you're a manager or anything like that, um, is doing retros. So I don't know if you all do this, but every week, 
we tend to analyze what went well, what didn't go well, what we should repeat, what we should begin doing, what we should never do again. It's a practice that um, I actually do with my brother as well to make sure that like, I'm very hard on him, but I wanna make sure that like, I'm, being, I'm doing it the right way that I want it to be done. I think it's very important to do the same thing in the workplace as well. Um, and so just ask people. A lot of people don't, and, and that's what actually hurt me in the beginning when I was um, doing the suit situation. Like I never asked, I just assumed dress the part that you want. That's what they tell you in school, right? Act like you wanna be that person, but a lot of times you, you also gotta remember never outshine the master either in the beginning, right? So that's, all, that's 48 Laws of Power. I don't believe all of the things in the 48 Laws of Power, but it's important, to un it's a book. It's important to understand those dynamics so you know um, what people might be using against you, especially as sisters and brothers. So yeah, another answer. So any other questions? Hello, I'm just... Well, <laughs> all good. Hello, I'm Giovanni Smith from Southern University. Shout out to Southern. I actually went to Southern Adventist University, but I know it's not at HBCU, but I love that it's called Southern. <laughs> That's it. Cool, cool. We'll accept you. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> um, I had a really quick question. I know okay. for me, I watch a lot of podcasts on strength and just regaining that ability to pursue the things that I want to pursue in my life and just understanding little things like Never Outshine the Master. So what would you say was the most life-changing podcast or blog or book that you read that made you understand that it doesn't matter who you are or what you do, but follow your passion and start now? It's a great question. I don't think it was a, a blog or podcast that changed my life, but I would say um, what you when you talk about strength, it made me think about routines. People don't talk about routines enough. A lot of like when I first moved to the Bay, they said it's, a, it's like this all-consuming thing when you're starting a startup, which it is, um, and that you weren't be, gonna be able to take care of your health. But we talk about this a lot. It's very important to take care of yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And so for me, it was going to bed before midnight. This doesn't always happen. But ideally, I try to be in bed by nine o'clock. I feel like every hour before midnight is worth two hours. I try to wake up at three o'clock, right? At 3.30, I like, I reflect, I pray at 3.30, I call my parents. Don't forget to call your parents or whoever your loved ones are that helps you build, because that helps you in another way that you may not realize. By five o'clock, I'm in the gym. 6.30, I'm in the shower seven o'clock and then it keeps going on and so forth and I figure out a way to like write in every hour of my day to get it done and then I also make sure I make time for music and then on the weekends like today I make sure that I do something in nature to balance and round it out and I would say ever since I started doing that and started thinking that every single day during the week I need to put every day should be a week's worth of work every week should be a month's worth of work ever since I started doing that it's just been nonstop productivity. So I would say that's that's the big thing. And then also listen to music. I have, I think about entrance music, at exit music. All kind, I think about life like a soundtrack. I think I do have something for you. Sorry, I know I'm rambling, but I'm, I'm thinking while we're talking, I know we're probably running out of time. I'm sorry about that. This is the last thing I'll say. Um, when you're working really, really hard um, and you're doing your best, always uh, remember that um, to wake up with a smile, do your best and watch the movie. Um, and that um, if you didn't get the opportunity and you did your best, it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't the right time. And what's most important is to keep going and when you look back, it all makes sense and you'll figure it out. Because there's a lot of companies I tried to get into before that I got rejected from, that I don't exist today, that like, and the, the, the feedback that I got from all those interviews made me warm today. So. That's most life changing. Always look for feedback. Always try to learn. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So I think we're out of time. Thank you all for letting me ramble and talk in front of you all. And I hope this was helpful. Everyone. Okay. Everyone, please give Ruben a round of applause. So you have all worked incredibly hard today. I hope everyone watching 
realizes how hard you've been working. Please join us tomorrow for day two of Be Smart Hackathon sponsored by Toyota. And good night. and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you have a Muslim, two lesbians, and whatever he is. I'm on pace to retire by 32 and a half. You've got a little bit of everything up in here. Welcome to the God Complex. And where I am today is a little thing called CEO of a billion dollar tech company. Yeah! And this is the story of how in the world that happened. You know what? We want TV without all that old TV stuff. We want live TV that's annual contract free, hardware free, commitment free, even couch free, walls free, pants free, just completely free to be free free because that's how we want it. Direct TV now, live TV on any screen, only from AT&T. TV? Nope. Don't we need to run? Nope. It just explodes in a high pitched. Yeah. I'm Sabrina Harris, and I just got promoted to project manager at a major tech company. I'm moving on up. My coworker invited me to move into this exclusive loft. The only place where cocky coders... I have this app called Gorilla Mom. ...are encouraged to be even cockier. There's no way you're a better coder than me. I'm a rocket scientist. I don't care what you think. <gasps> but wait a minute, you have...